Frank, um, I've had a long interest in rare diseases. I spent 21 years in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, at Genzyme, for most of that time, uh, which many of you may know, was had a very significant uh, portfolio uh, in the rare disease space. And then I spent the last five years uh, predominantly actually at FDA uh, and before I came uh, last October to Pharma. So, uh, you know, I'm going to base my comments on that experience and not necessarily on my position at Pharma. So these are sort of what I gather over that period of time. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a lot of compelling reasons, uh, many of which uh, Frank has thrown out there, for thinking about how to consolidate regulatory review expertise uh, for rare diseases. You know, it's, it's, it's very clear that actually the issues that we face often in the development of drugs for rare diseases are more common among each of these products in how they uh, need to approach very small populations um, and are, are more the same than they are actually different. And, uh, you know, so the general inconsistency that we often see as we go from review division to review division is inevitable, I think, in the current uh, scheme of how we're trying to uh, approach this. You know, I think um, on the other side, too, we, we see that expertise that is uh, focused around a therapeutic area is actually kind of not really there because when we talk about rare disease, it's probably true that most of the reviewers have not had experience with that rare disease because it's so rare. So they have to go out and get that expertise as well, often with consultation or with advisory groups, uh, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, obviously having therapeutic area expertise may be very useful in a disease that's primarily um, kidney-oriented or neurologically oriented. It gives them at least some understanding of the backgrounds, but perhaps not in that disease itself. So I think on one side, I've always felt that, for example, CEDAR could benefit greatly from having an office of rare diseases. Um, and I think now the creation of a division for rare diseases in medical genetics, which I think we'll hear more about from Lucas, um, is going to be uh, a really important step forward. On the other side of the coin, I think there are not just pros, there are some cons to be carefully considered here. And the number one con is, um, if we're going to use the Oncology Center of Excellence as a model, um, I think um, we should have some pause. It's taken a long time for that to get going. Even if we look at the moonshot and the funding that was being put forward from the moonshot, um, the leadership that Rick Pazder brings to the table, uh, there is a lot of concern on my part, and I think on some others, uh, that uh, we really should see the Oncology Center of Excellence come to fruition and really be running well before we try to now apply that model to something that's much more fractious uh, like rare diseases. Um, so I think that would be n my number one concern uh, in moving in that direction. I also think volume is another issue. Uh, now volume perhaps could be managed through a variety of different means, but over the last few, few years, we've really seen about 40% of new drug approvals are in rare diseases. Now maybe half of those are oncology, but that still leaves around 20% of new drug approvals uh, in the rare disease space. So that's a pretty big volume uh, for this center to try to deal with um, uh, on its own. Uh, and, you know, so as I think about these things, and as we listen to Janet this morning, I think she too pointed out a number of the issues um, that uh, would stand in the way of the success of this. So in, in a way, I feel we should walk maybe before we run. And so let's see what can happen with a division that's much more focused on rare diseases uh, in the cedar front, uh, let's make sure that we continue to have intercenter uh, cooperation with CBER and CEDAR in particular, I think, uh, and, and see how that can really bring us, I think, more quickly to where we want to go. Uh, and then 
when all the other pieces come together, let's talk again about a center. Yeah, I think I'm exercising prerogative of the chair. Rich, you and I probably met like about, I don't know how long ago, it was a long time ago, uh, 20 years ago or so. 20 years. Yeah, about yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And we were preparing for an ad comp. Neither so, of us had gray hair. Uh, at that time. Yeah, but, but we were preparing for an ad comp. So, so uh, I'm just going to ask you just quickly, any comment on the idea of a standing rare disease ad comp and, uh, or an office deputy director? Uh, yeah, I, I think that if you don't have a center, the office uh, deputy director is an interesting concept. I think uh, at the division level, it would be overkill, and I, I don't think we could come up with enough people to really man that um, who would have real expertise. Um, but at the office level, it, it, it's a worth a really good conversation. Um, I often felt while I was... Um, at uh, the FDA that actually uh, it would be really nice to have an advisory committee yeah. uh, with real rare disease expertise that could be combined when a rare disease product was being reviewed in the review session with uh, those therapeutic ex experts uh, on the um, particular therapeutic area um, advisory com committee. Uh, thanks, Rich. Um, Next up, uh, Paul Millmeyer from uh, Nord. Paul. Thank you very much, Frank, and a uh, big thank you to Every Life Foundation for inviting me to be here today. So I'm Paul Millmeyer. I'm the Director of Federal Policy at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. You're, you may be familiar with our organization, but um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit advocacy organization for those 30 million Americans with rare diseases. And, you know, the concept of a rare disease center of excellence at the FDA has um, intrigued us ever since really the concept of Center of Excellence at FDA in the first place uh, came about, especially after the Oncology Center of Excellence was created with the legislation as part of 21st Century Cures that, of course, would allow for additional Centers of Excellence to develop from there. But there are, I think, three additional points that we would want to add to the conversation. Uh, two in, you know, caveats would want to ensure would be the case if a rare disease center of excellence was indeed pursued. And then a third for additional ways in which a rare disease center of excellence or similar model could in fact be helpful actually outside of the review or uh, review of orphan products or consultation with industry on orphan products. So the additional, so the first two caveats that we would uh, want to bring to the conversation is uh, we'd of course want and would need to ensure that we have an internal champion within FDA for this idea. One of the reasons for why the OCE came about in the first place was because we had Dr. Rick Pazder, who along with, um, of course, uh, Dr. Califf and uh, Dr. Woodcock was, was there to support the idea in concert with Friends of Cancer Research as it was being enacted into law as part of 21st Century Cures. And that was really impactful uh, to have FDA there with um, those in the cancer community saying this is an idea that could work. This is something that we would support doing and that we would like to try out. So for a rare disease center of excellence to be successful uh, would of course need to ensure that FDA is fully on board with not only the specifics of the plan but the program in general. Uh, second from there would of course need to ensure that it's well funded. Um, we've had uh, plenty of good ideas uh, you know, in Congress or otherwise, um, even perhaps passed by Congress uh, for um, additional FDA activities, initiatives, responsibilities um, that uh, were authorized but never actually appropriated for or if they were included within the user fees or were, there weren't dedicated funding within the user fees to actually uh, pay for those programs. So um, what we would not want to see is for FDA to, uh, you know, commence the, uh, you know, initiation of a rare disease center of excellence without really dedicated funding behind it to ensure that it's going to be successful not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. So finally, the additional areas in which we could envision a rare disease center of excellence being impactful is not only, again, with the review of orphan therapies or the consultation with industry on orphan therapies, but really just the interaction that rare disease patients have with FDA. Because not only do orphan therapies present unique circumstances to FDA, rare disease patients themselves present unique circumstances to FDA. And you know, I can think of uh, several just off the top of my head. Um, you know, some of you may be aware that FDA is in kind of patient-focused drug development 2.0 right now in a sense. Um, they've had several draft guidances that have come out over the course of the last year, the most recent being on uh, collecting comprehensive and um, representative input from patients. 
And, you know, as, as we at NORD are reading this draft guidance, we see very general advice to the patient community that by and large might actually not be that helpful to many within the rare disease community because of, of unique circumstances that those within rare diseases face. You know, there's one part of that guidance that talks about consulting with, uh, you know, the statistician for the project. Well, how many of the 270 or 280 now member organizations within NORD, most of whom only have one or two staff members, have access uh, to a statistician or have one on retainer or something of that sort. You know, it just may, the, the model in which, uh, you know, the future of patient involvement at FDA is being rolled out, while very exciting for patients, and of course we're supportive of it, can oftentimes need a unique approach for those within rare diseases. And so if there was to have, if there was to be a rare disease center of excellence at FDA, this could be a role that someone within that center of excellence could play, to kind of consult with those entities within FDA who may be focused on the patients and may be rolling out some of these really exciting patient folks initiatives, but they're not focusing on rare, or they might not be familiar with the individual rare disease patient experience. This could also be applied to other areas, such as conflict of interest determinations for the, uh, uh, the FDA patient representative uh, program, where rare disease patients, due to their, uh, you know, the necessity of collaborating with industry are by and large found to be, uh, you know, conflict, uh, excuse me, conflicted and unable to participate within the patient rep program. Within the uh, listening sessions that uh, we just commenced with FDA, um, and are now holding with uh, review divisions, uh, having internal expertise within a center of excellence on, uh, uh, you know, on, on the patient experience to contribute to the development of the, those listening sessions and actually work with the review divisions and ensuring that those rare disease patients are able to connect well with the reviewers, the reviewers are prepared, and that um, you know, the, the voice of that rare disease patient is well represented there uh, would all be would all be impactful. So these are just additional ways in which having rare disease experts within FDA, and this could be within a center of excellence, who could in a sense consult with the different parts of FDA that um, you know, are involved with rare disease patients, either directly or indirectly in the sense of some of the patient-focused drug development, um, we believe could be particularly impactful and could be uh, a role for our rare disease center of excellence going forward. Uh, thanks much, Paul. Um, uh, Lucas? Hi, hi, I'm Lucas Kempf. I'm the Acting Associate Director for the Rare Diseases Program, which is um, in CEDAR and the Office of New Drugs. Um, and I've been uh, working in that role roughly about six months at this point. Um, and prior to that, I was a medical officer within our program. And prior to that, I was a team lead within the psychiatry division. So I've had several different roles um, since I've been at the FDA. And, um, and even prior to that, I was doing actually genetic research in neuropsychiatric disorders um, for about seven years while I was at the NIH, uh, working both as an investigator and a program officer. Um, so um, uh, two different points uh, that people have brought up to me in the context of this conference um, that I, I just wanted to sort of address as people have talked about it. Obviously, I can't advocate or lobby for any particular thing. Um, but I, what I can do is uh, give you some information about like uh, meetings that I've been in that uh, discuss the, um, the reorganization that Janet has talked about earlier and what that might mean for the rare disease community. Uh, obviously, it doesn't affect all the um, patient populations that are represented here, but um, it does some. So. Um, within the reorg, uh, to get you and I to kind of drill down and maybe give you those boxes that Janet kind of talked about earlier. Um, so there would be a office. What's been proposed is that there will be an office which will include the rare diseases program, which is combined in a single division with what used to be um, the inborn errors of metabolism group within DGIEP, um, which is the division of GI and endocrine. Um, inborn errors of metabolism. So they would take the, the reviewers with specialized experience with um, inborn errors of metabolism, who mostly are medical geneticists, and combine them into their own review division so that they'd have their own um, structure uh, to do the primary review that you are used to with your INDs and NDAs. And then adjacent to that group is the group that I run within, which is currently within the immediate office of um, 
the Office of New Drugs. So it'd be sort of moved down and over, but uh, adjacent. And the idea behind this is that the experience that we do as consultants across all the review divisions would um, uh, be influenced with, with this division of uh, medical genetics rather than inborn errors in metabolism. Because they don't just do inborn errors in metabolism, they do mitochondrial disorders, they do other um, genetic disorders are all within their portfolio anyways. And they're also very used to the issues that have been brought up in several of the presentations today of the heterogeneic disorders. Um, they may not be experts in individual aspects of each symptomatology, but they have a better concept of the fact that, you know, 80% um, of rare diseases or medical ge disorders, those are uh, uh, genetic disorders, and those genetic disorders typically present in heterogeneic ways with variability across the phenotype, and that, that's just the way that they've been trained. That, that's what they're used to seeing. They understand it in the context of what endpoints should be, how you approach that in a statistical design that's a little bit more worked out there than what you would see when you go into just a symptom cluster that falls hap, happens to fall in cardiorenal or psychiatry or neuro or derm or wherever. Um, so that sort of like get that expertise all in one area so that both the consultants from my group who go out and consult with the other divisions could um, gain knowledge um, from that review division but and translate that information out to the rest of the organization, but uh, vice versa. We could bring the, the experience that we're seeing in other areas back to that review division. Also, we um, provide a lot of uh, help, and we've talked a lot about it today, with guidance development. So what I've been doing since I've uh, been director is I've been going to the individual review division directors and saying, how can I help you with your guidance development. Where have you said the same thing twice to more than one person so we can put that together into a guidance document, get it out there quickly to the pop, you know, the populations that really need it so they can develop drugs in a, a quicker fashion. And unfortunately, we've been inundated with these because it's a huge pent up need. So obviously, if we had somebody in every one of these divisions who was the, the lead or the, uh, I guess, at the office level, perhaps, yeah that person could be having that conversation internally yep. within their own divisional uh, structures. Uh, but at this point, I'm doing that. And then uh, the other uh, aspect of it is um, we, we lack a pipeline of experienced people who have a lot of experience in rare, right? And so one of the differences of um, what you proposed is uh, it was in that four box model that uh, was presented earlier um, is uh, there's a coordination with the NIH um, that's going on within the oncology center in which people who are training fellowship at, in the oncology at NCI have an opportunity to come over to the FDA and get regulatory experience if they happen to be wow. interested in clinical trials. So you very early in your career get experience on actual regulatory um, uh, realities. So like people aren't out there in the world trying to figure this out and don't know the nomenclature and are trying to put INDs together at some academic center and go through the whole Rigman Road that probably multiple people in this room have had to go through as they try to figure out uh, the complexities of the regulatory process. That also provides um, a feed to uh, these reviewers that we talk about those problems with uh, uh, having enough FDEs. Yeah at the agency, and we also have a, a, a lack of um, the ability to hire in a sort of uh, uh, regular fashion. So when I talk to neurology, they've had some success using this sort of mechanism to get in some of the, some of the reviewers who are actually doing the rare disease portfolio for neurology is through wow. these programs of bringing people over from the NIH. Um, something like that might be helpful to have a sort of global way to do this for the agency because they have a special mechanism within that office of, uh, or that uh, center, center of excellence. Yeah. Um, another, um, uh, another aspect uh, that uh, we've talked about is, um, so we have the guidance development, we have training, we have 
um, staffing, and then there's the policy um, in general. So not only do we do these specific um, guidances, but we are in sort of listening sessions where we gather what we see across all the review divisions, condense that and put those out in guidances. So, so multiple of you probably have um, looked at um, the common issues guidance and there's other guidances that are going to be in development for that um, in that sphere. And so that's one of the things uh, that we do within our program that could be um, enhanced, presumably. Um, the other thing is science was one of her other boxes. Um, so it's an interesting to have this conversation like 35 years afterwards and the 10 years after um, our program has started because a lot of what we actually know about um, development in um, rare diseases like the numbers that uh, Rich quoted is because the rare diseases program created a knowledge management database. Um, of all the things that are being um, approved, which is we internally call it the DASH database. But um, so that's what gives us these numbers to understand what's going on in drug development within the rare diseases program or within the FDA, at least CEDAR um, program. And uh, we still have uh, a knowledge hole in what's going on in the development IND phase. And since I've been uh, working as the associate director, we've started to start tracking these INDs. And um, as you probably all know, now you have to check a little box on the front sheet that says, is it rare? Is it, does it have orphan status? And I can now query our database and know when you all have requested meetings, type A, B, and C, and I can track them and make sure that we're invited if it seems appropriate. Because in the past, it's only been if maybe somebody requested us to be there. Or if somebody was knowledgeable and said, hey, maybe we should have a rare disease expert to be at this meeting. Because with the busy lives that all these reviewers have, that may not be the first thing they think about um, when a meeting request comes in. So hopefully that whole process will improve. And also that we'll be able to give some research results from that in the future, be able to give you a better understanding of where the hiccups are in the development process mm -hmm. and where we can actually do general improvement. Um, um, so we are doing some of the stuff you're talking about, but it's not like consolidated mm -hmm. in a right. center or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, um, that's good. Now I appreciate that, Lucas. Yeah. That's that's excellent. And now we'll hear what your colleague in the Center for Biologics, uh, Dr. Witt and Celia. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Celia Witten. I'm the Deputy Director for the Center for Biologics. I've been at CBER for over a decade and before the last couple of years as Deputy, I was Office Director of the Office of Cell Tissue and Gene Therapy, uh, which is where Wilson is from now, who spoke earlier. And before that, I was at the Center for Devices and directed a device division, which also had a number of rare diseases, although most of the majority of the devices were not for rare diseases, we certainly had, there's certainly a number of those same kinds of issues in, in the Center for Devices. So I've seen these problems, for challenges from a number of areas. I have to say that I agree with what um, Dr. Woodcock said and really has been echoed by, uh, you know, the other colleagues here. I, I don't, I, so how I would say it is, uh, maybe I don't think the challenges are or that would be that would benefit from a center of excellence or so much from individual review uh, management of individual review programs, um, and I think for at least for gene therapy, as you know, Wilson was talking about uh, home runs, but I think for many of the therapies in in CBER, the, the the challenges aren't as much the clinical development as the product development or the product yeah. manufacturer, and that was echoed by a number of the speakers today, too. Mm -hmm. But where is there an opportunity? It's the kind of things that, you know, everybody's mentioned, especially uh, Lucas, things like looking across the board for policy issues that are ripe for development. Certainly, we heard a lot, a lot of mention in the previous sessions about the low molecular subset guidance. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the exact title, but you know, that guidance document, yeah, and there's therapy. other opportunities for guidance development also that are cross-cutting and might benefit from a, you know, a formal approach or informal 
discussions like we have now. Um, other areas are things like um, uh, natural history that we heard from a number of speakers this morning uh, and this afternoon about the importance of natural history studies and also a wish that in, there would be some way to uh, facilitate collaboration of those studies so that they could be the results could be shared by various developer development programs and along that vein also uh, request for things like master protocols so that when patients are enrolled in studies for therapies for rare diseases, there's a, a more ability to maybe either enroll them in studies, compare studies across development programs. Uh, and I, I can see all those things as being of value. So what I would say is there's a number of things that would be of value to some extent, as Lucas has already pointed out, we're doing some of them in various forms already in the agency. Um, to some extent, they could be improved or, or coordinated further. Uh, so I think it would be better in thinking about a center of excellence or those kinds of questions to start with, what are the goals? Like, what would be the goals that the center of excellence would want to achieve? Rather than starting with the structure of the oncology center of excellence and say, we want something that looks like that, say, we want something that accomplishes these goals, how are we going to achieve it? And it may be that the answer isn't necessarily a center. It could be, for example, there's certainly existing structures at FDA. There's the patient you know, affairs group that's uh, in the commissioner's office. There's the orphan products group. So that already have some of these functions. There's NIH, which has a strong um, orphan group as well. So in thinking about the Center for Excellence, I would think about existing things that are working and how to not undermine the things that are working, mm -hmm. but think about what the goals are and how to make use of existing, you know, existing opportunities. But some some of these ideas still might be, uh, you know, still might be helpful. So that's not to discount all those mm -hmm. suggestions. It's just to say, I don't think this the right starting point to me is not let's duplicate this structure because I don't think it'll accomplish yeah. the right goals. Okay. Go ahead, Alan. So, I'm Alan Beggs. I am a professor at Harvard Medical School and director of the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research. And so, in that capacity, I think I'm here really to represent the academic community. And on the stage here, I'm the person that knows least about the organization and the workings of the FDA. But as Celia was just saying, in terms of goals, I think I can probably say a few words about that. Um, and first, let me start out by pointing one thing out, and that is that Rare diseases are unique in that uh, with a smaller constituency, I think there's going to be now with the improvement in genomics and approaches to developing translational approaches, there's going to be a lot more work being done, as Paul mentioned, uh, by patient-funded groups, and we heard from Parent Project earlier, which has been very involved in this area, and by academic centers, and we're going to see increasingly number, increasing numbers of trials going forward with, without large pharma and without um, venture-backed biotechnology funds. And so really small groups of people without large amounts of resources, as statisticians, as somebody mentioned, um, or consultants available. And so one of the difficulties, I think, is the complexity of the entire process. FDA has a very broad mandate to protect safety and assure efficacy. And in that context, there's lots of different ways. The, my head is swimming with acronyms here, uh, be, as somebody who hasn't been familiar with all of this. And so for somebody coming to this, uh, to developing a drug for a biologic for the very first time, I think anything that can be done to improve the complexity is really a good thing. Now, one thing that strikes me is that um, the cancer center is obviously focused, is disease specific. And Dr. Woodcock's reorganization to make the FDA flatter is going to increase the number of review groups and have greater disease specificity. And I think that's really important because for any development program, you obviously need uh, domain experts for that particular disease. Uh, but then I think what Frank is suggesting is that we have a methodologically based uh, resource and that there's a certain methodology that goes along with 
developing treatments for a rare disease that may be a little bit different than for common diseases. And I think this is really where I think there's opportunity for improvement. It's where there's uneven or a lot of heterogeneity within FDA, um, as opposed to heterogeneity in the patient population. And I think that to the extent that a center could kind of even that out, that would be a good thing. So I'm not really necessarily endorsing or speaking against a particular mechanism or, or uh, organizational structure, but I think that that concept of that goal is very important. Um, and then the other thing in it, um, actually let me just tell you quickly a brief story about a remarkable success story um, and then some of the questions that it raises for us. A children's hospital, a neurologist colleague of mine, Dr. Tim Yu, diagnosed a patient with Batten disease, which we heard about from Dr. Crystal earlier, and diagnosed her second mutation, which turned out to be a de novo, so therefore a unique to her, mutation where uh, splicing was altered in the middle of an intron. Uh, the, he did that in March of 2017. You may be aware of this, um, Lucas. Um, uh, between uh, July of 2017 and I think probably November, Dr. Yu developed an allele-specific oligonucleotide to correct the splicing much the same way that for spinal muscular atrophy is done. Yeah. So this is an N of one drug for an N of one patient. That She is the only person on this planet we know of with this unique de novo mutation. And remarkably, uh, partnering with a family who was not wealthy but had a lot of wherewithal and was able to raise about a million dollars. Dr. Yu was able to work with FDA in a remarkably efficacious way to get approval uh, to start treatments, I think, in February of this coming year, of this last year. So we went from March making the diagnosis to February, um, January or February treatment starting. And the process required Tim Yu to um, identify a group of experts, uh, consultants, and uh, people to help him interface with the FDA. I think you probably had a large team involved with this. Um, and from his perspective, they were answering questions for the very first time on both sides. Both sides worked very efficiently, but it took a million dollars. It took, the, the amount of time was very rapid. And having done that, the question is, how can they leverage that experience for the next time this comes along? A lot of the questions they had to deal with in this situation were unique to this situation, but the way they were approached probably could be generalizable. And so it was one experience, one IND, um, I presume one review group, but uh, I think there's an opportunity there to spread that knowledge. And the question in my mind is would a center of excellence like this be a structure where that would get spread? And then just the last thing I'll point I'll make is that I'm struck by the fact that a number of the diseases we study have multiple potential therapeutic modalities, and in particular that cross the um, divide between drugs and biologics. And so, for example, uh, for spinal muscular atrophy or for myotubular myopathy, a disease I study, gene therapy is being developed. At the same time, oligonucleotide-based therapies are being developed, and so I'm presuming these are each managed in a different center. Um, however, you each require the same basic information about endpoints and uh, natural history and so on. And so the more integration between your two centers there can be, I think, the better. And I know a lot of that occurs. So the question now, and I'm not really saying what I think, is would a center of excellence for rare diseases actually help facilitate some of this? <laughs>